Amen. All right. Bless the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for the word. My spirit's ready. My, my soul's eager to receive. All right. So turn your uh, music sheet over. And if you haven't numbered it, number one, two, three, four, and five. Just one right on down. Okay. Because we're going to give you five questions that you're going to write down, hopefully. And it, don't worry about it if you don't know the answer. Remember, the idea behind this is to get you, I'm, I want to get you in the Word on your own, not in your PDA or on your phone in the Word. Get your Bible out, start scratching, start making notes, and really start studying, because there's going to come a time, the only thing you're going to have to stand on is the Word. And if you don't know much Word, you're going to be an easy pushover, and God will have to probably take you home early. Amen, because you it won't be the only thing you'll frighten is, the, who knows, maybe the dog down the street. <laughs> we want to be able to get up in the morning and the devil tremble, right? All right, so first question I want to ask you. Please don't say it out loud. Make a little blank spot there and write it in, okay? What's another name for the word? There's a bunch of them, so just write one down. What's another name for the word? All right, question number two. How many books are there in the Bible? How many old? How many new? And all together, how many? If you're really good, you can tell me how many authors there were. And don't panic if you can't remember. Come on. That's... You know, we're in the spirit, right? Third question. How many fruit can you name of the spirit? Fruit, not gifts. There's nine of them. How many of the nine can you name? All right, question number four. And even if you just get one fruit, that's okay. Should be able to at least get one. All right, question number four. What's the largest book in the Bible? And what's it about? Remember, I'm not grading you or anything, you know, so. <clears throat> I think a lot of times we throw out the Bible quizzes and stuff because we think a lot of times when we know things and when we actually don't. I went through like a fifth grade Bible quiz book and I actually missed like three or four. I'm going, my goodness, you know, I better get in there and look at that again. All right, and the fifth question. Name three parts of man. According to the word. And when you get them, put your pin down. I'm never coming to Bible study again. <laughs> yep, yeah, all right, that's good. Uh, no, that's for the next time. Yeah, depending on the version. Okay, all right, is everybody done yet? Or did you go into so much detail you're still writing? <laughs> the idea behind this is to keep you fast on your feet. The reason why we have so many Jehovah Witnesses down here is because they didn't know how to answer their Bible questions. A lot of them come out of Methodist churches and Lutheran churches and Baptist churches. Maybe they didn't get in and really learn about you know, Pentecostal churches because they're ignorant concerning the word. And literally, Satan knows the word, doesn't he? Yes. So you should know it too. Okay, number one, another name for the word. Who, anyone? Come on. Sword of the Spirit. Very good. That's the one I thought of. Sword of the Spirit. 
Another answer, come on. Jesus? Another one? Come on, I want everybody to answer. Let's see where you're at. No, you're putting me on. You're putting me on the spot. Listen, either I or God, you're going to have to answer. <laughs> Hello, he'll put you on the spot. All right. Well, BJ, what'd you get? First question. Yeah, and well, it'd be the word, sword of the spirit, amen. It would be, um, um, oh gosh, there's a bunch of them, you know. Anyway, that's fine. Good enough. Bible works just fine. All right, two. How many books are there in the Bible? How many in the old? 66 in the total. How many in the old? Anybody? Anybody? Besides my wife. <laughs> 39, very good. How many in the new? <laughs> 27. So it makes 66 all together. Third, how many fruit can you name? Fruit of the Spirit. Notice not fruits, plural, it's fruit, singular. So the fruit is Jesus, but he's broken up in nine portions. BJ. Peace, love, joy. Uh, peace, love, joy. Kindness. Kindness would work. Gentleness, goodness. Long-suffering and faithfulness. Okay, yeah. Anybody else want to make a stab? I just named them. What'd you, what was the last one, Danny? Uh, self yeah, that's patience. Okay. All right, same thing. All right, fourth question. What's the largest book in the Bible? And before you holler out the answer, can I call on any of you? <laughs> no. Do you know what it is, anybody? What'd you write down, Joe? How about you, Marvin? What'd you write down? See, makes you make a pastor proud. Psalms. Psalms. Yeah, somebody was paying attention. And which part of Psalms is the largest chapter? 119. Right, and what's it about? It's about the Word of God. Largest chapter? Largest, okay, right? Chapter 119, all about the Word. So how important do you think God wants the Word in our life? Very important. All right, you scholars. This is only um, a small little test, so anyway. Number five, name three parts of man. Shall I call on you? Sure. BJ. The body or flesh, soul, and spirit. Yep. Flesh, soul, and spirit, or spirit, soul, and flesh. How many got that? Raise your hands. All right. All right. And for the rebellious, stand in the corner. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's go ahead and get in our lesson tonight. Father, we just thank you for the word of God. It's so rich. It's so wonderful. But you got to fall in love with you and you got to just want to be in the word of God. It isn't something that, oh, we have to do because of homework, Father. So put a desire in our hearts to, to go after you, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord. And part of that is seeking you first in your word. You said to search the scriptures, for in it you'll find me. And so, Lord, we just thank you for all those things. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding as we study the how-to series on knowing a tree by its fruit. So now you know why I had the questions that I asked, all right, okay? So in this lesson, we'll point out how to know a tree by the fruit it bears. Notice a tree doesn't bear fruit until it's mature enough. Hello? 
So a lot of times young Christians are so concerned about whether they do things right or wrong. What they need to be concerned about is getting to church, getting in the word and praying and don't worry about the right or wrong part. Do you remember when you first got saved that you were so happy and so excited you didn't even think about what, doing anything wrong? You were saved and there was an incubation period. Maybe for you, it was about three months for me until I suddenly had my eyes open and realized, whoops, now I need to start doing some things. I can't sit around and live off the grace of God all by myself. Now I need to start doing some things. But here's what happens. And you might get a little frustrated with me, but many Christians don't do anything. They sit and learn and learn and learn and learn, but they're not doers of the word. So what happens is sometime when they're 40 or 50 years old, they still can't answer biblical questions. The Holy Spirit's job is to take us and immerse us into the word. And so if we're not allowing God to immerse us into the word, something's wrong. Hello? Well, I got to wait till I feel like reading my Bible. Okay, we won't go there. All right, so let's read on. Follow me in this paragraph, okay? Each of us has a place and a calling within the local body. This is a local body. Let me ask you. You have a place and a calling. Do you know what your place is? Do you know what your calling is? And look at the next phrase. Read along with me, okay? All right. So when we walk, so, all right, so here's what you need to do. Okay, it says, we are stewards in these areas, and we are to take them seriously. People's lives are at stake. Do you believe that? The flock of God is just that. It belongs to God. You belong to God. So stop making your decisions for yourself. Surrender every day. Makes it easier. So when we walk in the midst of each other, we need to learn to build each other up and to be an encourager of hope and faith, making sure we ourselves are rooted and grounded in love and in the word. Now, folks, we need to be watchful that you don't trample on a tender plant. Young Christians, when they come in, they need to see you being a good example in the church. Can you say amen? That the elders are supposed to teach the younger, elder women, uh, elder uh, men, teaching the youngers, okay, so that they know how to grow up strong into them. We see a lot of young people come into church, and they're looking for somebody to watch as an example. And so they need to see that you and I are in love with God, in love with his word. Someone say amen. All right, so we want to make sure, again, we're, we don't trample under feet tender believers or to stir up the waters where people who are thirsty can't come and drink because you've stirred up so much mud and you're so carnal. So thank God none of that's here. Amen. So there's a lot more into ministry than meets our own eyes. So let's look at this. How to know a tree by the fruit. First of all, let me say this to you. Whose fruit should be what we be watching? Everyone... Point at yourself. You should be watching how your fruit is growing. How's your fruit growing? It's got splats all over it? I'm just going to be fun. Is it shrivelly? Is it immature? Are you still a believer that isn't producing much fruit? What are you doing for Jesus? Fruit is the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness involved in the actions that we do in the body of Christ. This produces the fruit because it's not us doing the work, but God in us doing the work. For this very thing, we were created for good works. So works follow our faith and never our faith follows our works. Can you say amen? So again, one of the things I need to bring up is, in the church, you need to find out what is your position. Are you an eye? Are you a mouth? Are you a hand? Are you feet? Or if you're like me, a floating kidney in the body of Christ. 
My job is to clean it up. No, <laughs> that's not my job. Anyway, the idea is every one of us have a place. But most Christians, because they allow the enemy to distract them, don't know what their calling is. They have no clue what they are. And yet the Bible says that God puts us in the body as it pleases him. So ask yourself, do I really know what I'm supposed to be doing? Don't look at me that way. I'm not picking on you. You should be asking yourself, do you know what you're supposed to be doing? Now, I want to tell you, I know what each one of you is supposed to be doing. But, but God has to reveal it to you. He doesn't want me to tell you. Because then you could accuse, well, God, why'd you have the pastor tell me? He's always on my case. Hello. We don't want anything like that happening, do we? All right. So there's a lot more to your place in the body of Christ because God puts you and made you wonderfully and fearfully, but he puts you in the body of Christ to please him. So you should be saying, Lord, am I pleasing you? Am I doing what you're supposed, am I supposed to be doing? You need to be asking him these questions. What could I be doing more? What could I be doing less? You know, those are good questions because you know your God's perfect and he's going to work on you. You're like, remember, you're the clay and he's the potter. You're not, you're not the potter to tell, you know, the clay what to do. God tells us how to behave. But we sometimes want God to tell us the way we think he should. <laughs> we can get in trouble that way. Can you say amen? Say, not me. All right. The text for tonight is in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. Did you type the right? Okay, all right. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is a prophecy way before the birth of Christ about Christ, okay? Because he quotes it in Luke 4. He quotes it in Matthew so this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears, he says. And the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. To preach what? All right, yeah. To set, uh, to, and he has sent me to uh, heal the brokenhearted. Yeah, that's good. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Yeah. And the opening, eye, uh, the opening of the prison to those that are bound. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort those that mourn. To console those that mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called the trees of what? Trees produce fruit, don't they? You are the planting. You're the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So guess what? We're like a tree. Have you ever noticed trees? They go through four seasons here in Washington, don't they? What can, who can name the seasons? You want to start with what? Spring, summer, fall, and winter. You can start with any season you want. Did you know Christians go through a spring, summer, fall, and winter? I was probably one of the first ones that taught this over 30 years ago. And that is, a tree goes through four, four types of growth, but it goes through four seasons. Christians go through seasons. Number one, we have a spring season. That's a season where you're growing, you're in the word, things are developing, you're excited. You go through a summer season. I'm going to just do it fast. Where now you're producing fruit. Fruit is beginning to produce towards the end, getting ready for fall. And what happens in the fall? The leaves fall off. The tree begins to shut down outwardly, reevaluates and readjusts inwardly, and then goes into winter dormant time to reflect. So a Christian goes in their springtime, their summertime, their fall time, and usually Fall and winter times where Christians start to get their eyes off of Jesus and they put him on their circumstances. Well, God's not moving in my heart anymore. Maybe I'm in the wrong church. Maybe I need to get rid of that pastor. 
And what you are is you're going through a fall season where your outward expressions are now turning inward and God is getting ready to cause more growth in you. How many know that things have to change on the inside of you before things change on the outside of you? Say that with me. God has to change me more inside so it shows more outside. Well, first of all, let me explain. When you get born again, you're perfect, you're, you're perfect in your spirit, man. So that's not what changes. Your soul is changing. Your soul is your personality, your will, your mind, your emotions, your appetites. Hello. And your soul is what's developing. So if your soul is not developing very well, for example, we can look at Einstein. He was exposed to a lot of mathematics, a lot of scientific things. He was like the kid that has his computer in his room and becomes a computer whiz. Hello. But you know what? You take that same man who's a computer whiz and you put him with society, and because he's not learned to develop his soul in society, he is absolutely stupid in one area and smart in another. Yes. And God wants us well-rounded. Can you say well-rounded? Well -rounded. Amen. He doesn't want us pulling into ourselves if we're called to the ministry, because mm -hmm. the ministry is people. So if we pull into ourselves, then we are disobeying God because he wants us out where the people are and not into ourselves where the people have to come visit us. It's like these Christians that run store food and hide in the woods for the end times. God said go into all the world. He didn't say go out, hide out, and store food. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So we lose the simplicities of the gospel because we get into our own mind trying to figure things out. But folks, what is your place in the body of Christ? What is God telling you? How mature are you in your place? How is the fruit developing in your life? Hello? Are you an extrovert? Are you still an introvert? Don't claim any of that. You need to be balanced vert. You need to have as much going out as you got coming in. You got to explain, be able to be people friendly as well as God friendly. Amen. You shall know a tree by the fruit it bears. Yes. Bearing means it's coming out where people live. It's coming out where people can enjoy. So guess what? There should be so much love coming out of you. People just want to hang around you. Amen? So if it's not happening that way, don't feel sad. Have it changed. God changed me. I'm tired of looking my mug in the mirror. Change me. I don't hear many Christians. I ask God, I says, God, how often do you hear people say, change me? He says, only when they feel sorry for themselves. He says, usually they're so busy doing what they want to do, they forget that the only way they can do anything is because I'm helping them. Hello. That's humbling, isn't it? All right, so not, I'm not going to dwell there for much. So the gospel is simply liberating people, right? Recovering a sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the everlasting gospel. Gospel means good news. Can you say amen? amen. Not judgment is coming on America. That's not good news. That's not from God either. Judgment comes first to the house of God. And you know what God says to you and I? If you have Jesus in your heart, you're acquitted and your sins are forgiven. You're the righteousness of God. Now sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. You and I need to kick back, be obedient, find out what is our place in the body of Christ and bear fruits to that calling. You can tell I'm a pastor, okay, because everything talks about it. I don't have to say, I'm a pastor, I'm a pastor. But I hear a lot of Christians say, I'm this and I'm that, but the fruit does not testify of that. Hello? We want to have fruit that testifies of our call. Amen? See, if you are a person that hates kids, you're not going to be put in a nursery. You're not going to bear any fruit. Hello? So the idea is, where is your place in the body? 
And are you settled down, surrendered, and bearing fruit? And if not, just go to God and say, God, all right. Let's scratch all the stuff I've been doing. And let's find out what I need to be doing. And you know, sometimes that's the most refreshing thing that you can ask God. Now remember, I'm talking to the people in camera too. Not just you guys, all right? So I want you to realize that these, I hope these are, after we're raptured, these will be played, okay? All right, so getting past all that, we are the what? Trees of righteousness, aren't we? And trees bear what? And they grow in four areas. We develop in four areas. Can you tell me what they are? Okay. I'll show you what they are in a minute. But we go through four seasons, don't we? Can you tell me those? Spring. You don't have to be perfect. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. Right? So if you feel like God's mad at you and nothing's going around in your life, what season might you be in? Fall or winter. So the moment you're in fall and winter, the last thing you need to do is start practicing like it's summer. If you're in fall or winter where God need, you need to be evaluating within yourself if you are being productive, if you need to change in areas, and now you're still wanting to go out there and produce fruit and, and do a whole bunch of things you did while it was spring and summer, and you're going to find yourself more frustrated than anything else because you're not in the right season doing the right thing. Hello? Okay, so let's go on. Now, you shall know a tree by what? Yeah, also by how it grows. Okay, by its root and by a grove. A couple of points underneath that. You see it? Marvin, you see, reading along with me? You should know how a tree grows. Let me say this. We are like fruit trees. We are to bear what? Much fruit. Not just fruit, much fruit. That means every year you produce new fruit. How's a tree grow? Through the four what? That's right. And every season it brings more fruit. Hello. It brings fruit in the fall and winter? No. It's reevaluating. God in us is reevaluating. So when spring comes, we're going to produce more fruit. And every branch in me I prune that it bear more fruit. And so shall you be my disciples. So it says if you're bearing fruit, you're my disciple. So what does that mean if we're not bearing fruit? Just think about that. Let's move right on. Two, a tree grows in four ways. Can you tell me? Spring, summer, and fall. No, those are the four seasons. That's okay. That's all right. It grows, and we're going to list them for you. So let's go to the place where it lists them. What did you say? BJ, did you have an answer? Well, I was thinking it grows down. Yeah. Grows down, grows up, grows out. One more. She already got the deep part. Here, we'll, we'll go ahead and read it. We'll, here in Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21. I'm going to read rather quickly, but we're going to emphasize the growth pattern, okay? For this reason, I bow my knees, Paul says, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named, that he might grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man. What's the inner man? Denise, what's our inner man? Our spirit and soul. Okay? Our outer man is our flesh. Our inner man is our spirit and our soul. It's the heart of man. Okay? All right, so that's okay. We're going to get, used, get you used to these terms. Very important. That's why listening to a million teachers and somebody has their own opinion about the Word of God is not good. You need to get terminology down. You need to know the difference between the day of the Lord and the rapture. Certain terminologies. Otherwise, you're going to get lost when you read the scripture. Because you're reading by your own understanding or what you've been told rather than what the Spirit of God is showing us. So let's go on. It says that he would grant you according to the inner man 
the riches of glory according to the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in what? In love. The reason God wants you, and, and you're right, you can use the word Christ, the reason that God wants us rooted and grounded in love, what do you think that reason is? Why? Because God is love. So to be rooted and grounded in love would be rooted and grounded in God. So nobody's going to move you out of God, right? You're not going to compromise God, are you? No. Uh -uh. Okay. And that he may be able to comprehend with all the other saints. Now here's the four areas of growth. What is the width? Okay, the height, or excuse me, the length, the depth, and the height. So, Danny, what was the one you said, depth? Yeah. And I think the one is width that we missed. Okay, all right, so breadth, some people will say. So, let's look at them. We have width, length, depth, and height. Now, you have a little list right there in your notes, and it tells you what the width is really talking about. What you and I grow in width means we develop with integrity and we develop in character. Everyone say integrity, integrity. and character. character. See, integrity means you are going to become a person of your word. You're going to mean what you say and say what you mean. So as you develop in width, in character, and integrity, folks, you will know who you really are when you are like three days out all by yourself and the tempter comes, how much character and how much integrity you have. Because you'll find out when you're by yourself how much that temptation you yield to. Now all of you understand that you, God, have to work that salvation out, right? And you're going to have weak spots. So don't be thinking you're the only one that suffers with your own weak spots. The key is, in order for you to develop with integrity and character, you have to spend quality time with God because he brings the integrity out of us and the character out of us. Otherwise, you'll just become a character. Hello, we got plenty of those saying they're Christians running around. You don't never know what they're going to do. They're crazy. They're up one minute, down the next. They're gossiping. They're doing this. They're thinking for, you know, joining the next bandwagon. See, that shows no integrity and no character. So we develop in width. How many here are a little bit more developed in character than you were tw maybe 12 years ago? Yeah, so now you got it. Two, length. Length deals with endurance and tenacity. How many know we're to stick with God and never give up? So one of the areas that we develop in is our ability to endure. Hello? Remember what it says, the parable of the sower? Those on the wayside receive the word joyfully. But have, they have no desire in themselves. And then the enemy comes right away and steals it, right? And those that fall along stony ground, uh, they, they love to hear the word, it's great, but they develop no root. They're just a go feel good person. Oh, wherever the wind blows, hallelujah. Don't call on me, you can never get me to dedicate to nothing. Hello? You know, so length really shows that we're not going to give up the next time the wind blows. Can you say amen? Stay the course. Do you have tenacity? How many's ever seen a bulldog? Yeah, once they lock their jaws on something, that's tenacity. How about you? You found out what your position is in the body of Christ and lock your jaws on it? Third way we develop when we walk with God, is depth. Depth talks about stability and confidence. Somebody tell me the difference between pride and confidence. Mm -hmm. 
sure you're really, you know who you are. Confident. Exactly. You're, you're, you're not going to be moved, right? So you're developing a depth, your stability, your confidence. Now, pride is the projection of oneself. Confidence is your trust in the greater one inside of you. You're confident that God's going to get you through it. You're confident that greater is he that's in you, right, than he that's in the world. You're not making brash statements saying, I can do this. This is my, not my first rodeo. You see what the difference? Okay. Or my first parade or whatever. Okay. So we got width, length, now depth. Now the fourth one is height. Height talks about our maturity and our spirituality. Hello. How high has God brought you? How many know that all promotion comes from God? So your best way to get promoted is to get your face down and be humble. Humble yourself and then God will lift you up. If you lift yourself up, then God will humble you. Amen. So go strut yourself around. I watched people who thought they were really cool and get up and just do some of the most dumb, stupid, clumsy things. And God's saying, see, you're not all that without me. Right in front of God and everybody, on TV and all. I watched a pastor, a good, good guy, good guy, lose it on a golf course because of pride. He, he, he just couldn't hit the ball. Instead of admitting God helped me hit the ball, he got up there and started bragging. I'm pretty good. And you guys are going to start all the man, melty mouth, mouth kind of thing. And you know, he meant well. He's all goofing, Right? So the first whack, he whacked it out somewhere. And, and then the, in the second hole, and he was just doing terrible. He got so angry, he took his club and bent it on his knee and threw it into the water. This is a well-known pastor. And you go, wow. Now, you're, I bet you you're wondering, I wonder who that was. Well, it wasn't me, because I don't golf. I've tried it, and you don't want to take me golfing. But anyways, we, our character really has to display our spirituality. So we have wit. What's wit? Wit has to do with what? Integrity and character. Length, endurance, and tenacity. Depth, stability, and competence. Hype, maturity, and spirituality. Amen? You who are spiritual, Galatians 6, 1 says... Restore such a one. You see, spiritual people restore and try to help. Where a carnal person could just be pointing a finger and finding fault. You know, and so we want to see the difference. Say amen, somebody. So finally, point five. Remember, each of us should cultivate our own fruit. Not somebody else's. Can you say amen? amen. And stop picking on one another's fruit. Amen. I, I had a guy tell me, and it was a long, long, long time ago. He says, I'm a fruit inspector. I said, you're a what? He says, I'm a, I said, do you work over there in eastern Washington? He said, my job is to make sure people are bearing fruit. I says, no, it's not. That's God's job. Can you say amen? Because about the time you are aligning and, and sizing people up, God's going to show you where you're at. And, Sometimes it's not all that good. <clears throat> all right, so let's go on. Next point. You shall know a tree by its what? Fruit. Matthew 7, 16 through 23. Let's go ahead and read along. In your notes there, are Marvin 2. It says, beware of false prophets. What is a false prophet? Go ahead. I mean, it's Bible study. What's a prophet? Important to know that, but it's okay. Somebody that proclaims the word or what they say is the word from the Lord. Now, let me ask you this. Most people don't know. 
what's the difference between an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet? Quite a bit of difference. Go ahead. Perfect, Danny. All right. Would you really like to know the difference, everybody? Danny just said it right. In the Old Testament, the prophets were given. Remember, God's will was revealed unless it was revealed first to the prophets. So the prophets were foretelling what was to come. Everyone say foretelling. foretelling. Okay. Now in the New Testament, and Danny answered absolutely correct, it's forth telling. When the prophet speaks for the real true New Testament prophet speaks forth, it's happening. Okay? But you'll hear a lot of people speaking forth in the New Testament, Old Testament prophecy. Yay, if you obey me, then they just start doing all these prophets, and God's bringing judgment. Old Testament prophets. First of all, God lives in you, right? Yeah. And if you have somebody come up and says, well, God told me he was going to get you. you. You have sin in your life. He was going to get you. What do you say about something like that? That's a false prophecy. Why? Because God lives inside of you, and he remains to be the first one to tell you personally. You see, in the New Testament... New Testament prophets only confirm what you know you heard from God. Old Testament prophets brought forth the will of God. They were fore foretelling it. In the New Testament, they are only confirming what God wants to tell us personally. So if somebody comes up to Marvin and says, Marvin, sell your house, move to Florida, you know, blah, 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 blah. But God never spoke to Marvin about that. Then you, the person saying that to Marvin, is speaking what? Falsely. So there, I find there's three kinds of prophecies that people fall into. They, they receive a prophecy in the New Testament from God, which is a foretelling. Or they, what they, they speak is what we call accumulated prophecy. Do you know what I mean by accumulated prophecy? That means they sit in a congregation and watch certain people and then they come up with a word for them. Oh yeah, I see it happen all the time and I'm in a little church. Okay, that's not right. And I've seen people do it pretty good. You know, that's what a con artist does. Oh, God wants to heal you. I noticed that you have a cur curvature of the spine. Why? Because the person's limping all around church. <laughs> Hello. So, we got to be careful because when a New Testament prophet is speaking, if I say to you, God is healing you now, you better receive a healing. Amen. Not that you have to receive it. It's just the healing's happening now. Yeah. You see, that's how... The New Testament is so much better than the Old Testament. So much quicker. You know, Daniel in the Old Testament was prayed 21 days and fasted. And it took 21 days for the angel to answer the prayer. So we want to take that. Oh, but sometimes God takes a while in prayer. Remember Daniel in the Old Testament, they say. That's a sacred cow. In the New Testament, you go, Father, in Jesus' name, and the prayer is on its way. There's no delay. Hello? Well, why is there seem like a delay then? Because of the will of man. If, if, if you pray and say, God, you know, I need a new car. And God says, I'm going to give you one. Now he's got to go to somebody and let him know, get carry a new car. I, I'm, I'm making all that up. Do you understand? But it's up to the person to obey God. So it could take that person a year to obey God. So there's delay that way, but there's no delay anymore because there's a great big battle in heaven. No, Jesus ripped that apart. He destroyed it, made a public shows of them. So Satan's not resisting your prayer. 
He's trying to get you to look another way when the prayer is being answered. He's trying to get you to walk off when somebody's trying to hand you the blessing. Yeah. And just tell yourself, if you prayed and believe you received, if you're starting to have doubt, that's just the devil tipping you off. He believes you're going to get it or he wouldn't be telling you lies. All right, moving right along. Are you getting anything out of this tonight? We're supposed to be bearing fruit. So what is your place in this body? What are you supposed to be doing? And are you working diligently to be very good at that? If not, you better. Because God wants working members in the body. He doesn't want sitting members in the body. Although we can sit for a while. It's okay. Can you say amen? So Moses started when he was 80. So let's not use that as an excuse. All right, so let's go on. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravenish wolves. In other words, they're mean. Okay? You will know them by their what? Fruits. Notice the word S. Fruits. Okay? Do men... Now listen. This is very important. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? What's the answer? Huh? But did you know you can be a thorn bush? Your fruit is in what part of your three-part human being? Spirit, soul, or body? It's in your spirit. The fruit of the spirit's in your spirit. The fruit is Jesus. The love, joy, and peace is in your spirit. It's totally complete. Now, how much fruit comes out is how much you let out. Can you say amen? By yielding your will and your mind and your emotions to him. I'm just telling you the truth. You might not want to hear it, but it's still the truth. Okay? You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a good uh, bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? is cat cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, a lot of people get all paranoid about that. Listen, if you're not producing fruit in the New Testament, now, Jesus is talking Old Testament here. Remember, he's not New Testament until he dies and rises again. So he's dealing with people from an Old Testament thought. He says, if you're going to stand up and represent God... Nobody's going to want to listen to you if you're all thorn bushy and, and thistly. If you're going to represent me, you've got to get the good tree to produce good fruit. So you've got to get good in the tree. The good in the tree is the Messiah coming for thee. Amen. So open your heart and accept him and then let him take the lead. And you'll produce fruit. Even in things you don't quite do right. God will produce fruit in it. Because he says, even if you give a prophet a glass of water in the name of a prophet, and you will no wise lose your reward. So it says, hey, when I'm a Christian and I do things out of love and out of Christ and love, even if I'm clumsy, I'm going to produce all kinds of fruit. Hello? I could just look back when I was a young Christian. I was getting people saved left and right. And I didn't know anything I was doing. Hello? So now that we got older now, why aren't we having such success? I tell you why. Because we're taking on the religious practice and not letting God take the forefront. Now I'm referring to all of us and everybody who doesn't let Jesus bear fruit in us. Because there's no reason in the world we should bear much fruit. Correct? Because the fruit bearer is where? In our heart. So what's blocking the fruit from coming out of you? We are. I'm not going to raise my hands. I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Well, Gary, I don't care. 
<laughs> you're going to have to answer for it. I don't really care. I want the best for you. Somebody asked me the other day, he says, why do you make suggestions to people and always try to make people better? I says, that's my calling. I'm a pastor. Hello? How many parents do we have in this room? How about your children? Didn't you try to get them to be better than you? What makes you think God is any less? So listen, why resist him so much? You should be changing. Let me say it this way. Every month, I should see a change in you. I should see a change in you. Every day, you should see a change in you. And ask God about every three days how it's going. I'm serious. You should be writing this down. Because when you do that, you'll immediately straighten up and start producing fruit almost overnight. The problem is, we want to discover it on our own. We don't want to be told what to do. But listen, God put pastors in the church to equip the saints to teach you. Okay? Frankly, I could, I'd rather go fishing. <laughs> I could catch more that way. See, so, but God called me to preach and to share. And literally in my life through these 40 some odd years, we have seen literally thousands of people saved and changed. Just this little ministry. Back in my other ministries and other teachings and studies, thousands, over two or 300 ministers that are actively now all over in certain parts of the world, have some form of influence that we've had in their life. That's really good. Somebody says, well, aren't you concerned? Your, your disciple over here has is, is got a huge church and it's bigger than your original church, Pastor Kerry? No, because anybody that I help train, when they're producing fruit, listen to me carefully, I get the, the fruit that they produce too because I was involved in training them. So think about it. How about you? The people you're training, are they producing fruit? Then you get the fruit that they produce on your credit too. So if you're winning two or three hundred, think of Billy Graham. He went to that one crusade, or was it Billy Sunday? I can't remember which one. And there was only one person who showed up. And he preached his heart out. But what unbeknownst to him, there was a guy underneath the eaves of the church that was passed out from alcohol. He heard everything that Billy Sunday, I think it was Billy Sunday said, got saved. Or maybe it was another preacher, Billy San Sunday got saved. I don't remember exactly how the story is. But sometimes what we see with our eyes isn't what's really happening. Everyone say iceberg. Just because you see something doesn't mean there isn't a volume of something more in our lives. So remember, let God do it through you. All right, and finishing. All right? It says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the thing. Where is the kingdom of heaven, folks? Well, part of it's in you. But when did the kingdom of heaven come? At Pentecost, it dropped down in with the Holy Spirit. He said, every molecule that you and I breathe, actually, if God opened our eyes, we could see the kingdom is like the garden that you and I walked in the beginning in Adam. There's access to everything that the kingdom has. But the only way you can access it is through Christ by the Spirit. Satan can't get there, a carnal person, a carnal Christian can't do that. So he says, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord. So now you understand that it isn't a human works that we approach the kingdom in. We simply approach the kingdom in a humble spirit, putting Jesus first, and the kingdom just opens up, and God says, okay, shop. What is it you need? What kind of equipment? All right, now realize if I give you this equipment, I'm going to have to train you to use it. So we have access in and out of the kingdom of heaven, which is invisible. It is not accessible from the devil. The devil can't go there. He can't shop there. 
He doesn't have a membership. Can you say amen? But neither does your flesh. Your flesh can't go in there and pull out anything from God. You have to go in there spiritually. You have to approach God spiritually. So how do we do that? Humility. Lord, I need your help today. Or instead of saying, hey, God, it's you and me, baby. So I'm trying to show a correlation. So ask yourself, how humble am I really? How humble am I really? Am I humble enough, God, so you don't resist me with the Spirit? Or are you only leaking in 10% when I need 100%? What am I allowing God? And ask God. And then he'll begin to walk you right through it. There's no condemnation. He'll show you, and you'll discover it, and it'll all be part of this wonderful growth. You're growing deeper. You're growing in more character. You're growing in endurance. You're growing spiritually. Can you say amen? You're bearing fruit. Christians that don't bear fruit are cut off. Not only that, but the world makes fun of them. It says you'll be cast forth like a branch cast into the fire. And men will trample you under feet. What does that trample under feet mean? It means that they won't respect you. And they'll just walk all over you because you're one of those Christians that doesn't live it. You just talk it. We call that a hypocrite. So thank God that's none of us. Can you say amen? Everyone take a big breath. <coughs> How much do you really listen? Amen. All right. So a couple of points. Number one. A good tree has what? Good fruit. A good tree has good intentions, pure motives, and walks in love. Can you say amen? Say, that's me. Two, a good tree grows out of love for Christ and others. I want to get this printed up, and I want it on my sign out here. Love God, love people, and walk with Jesus. Now, I know lots of people use the love God, love people. But they say, live like Jesus. And they say, be like Jesus. But they never say, walk with Jesus. Because unless we walk with him, we can't be like him because he has to teach us how to be like him. Because yes. we don't learn it on our own. Okay. And then thirdly, don't be a thorn or thistle in somebody's side. How you doing? Is something you're doing irritating everybody? Then get with God and have God fix you. Don't sit around and be an open wound. And get infected. And become a casualty. Hello? Say oh me or something. Then fourthly, a bad tree has selfish intentions... And a ravenous nature. What do you mean? Thorns and thistles. Remember it says a false prophet is a sheep in, a wolf in sheep's clothing. How can you tell? Well, when you talk to them, they're double. They're double standard. One minute they're happy, next minute they're crabby. Next minute they're crabby, next minute they're happy. Happy, then they're crabby. Crabby, then they're happy. You don't know. And some people will look at that and they don't know. Are you happy today? Uh, then I can talk to you. Do you understand? How can you go to somebody who's supposed to be projecting fruit and all you do is you get chewed out every time you go to them? Is yes, exactly what it means. Double-minded is simply going from the flesh to the spirit and from the spirit back to the flesh all in a matter of moments <laughs> instead of days. Some people will get excited one day and then everybody will get on their case. What are you doing? Then they'll try to reverse it. Then they'll get all in the flesh the next day. What I'm talking about is a double-minded person will say, yeah, I believe God. And then their head will start talking to them. And they'll vacillate from the flesh to the spirit, to the spirit, to the flesh. And what they need to do or what we need to do if that happens is go to God and say, cure me. Remember Romans 7, Paul says, when I want to do good, I want to do good, evil is present with me. 
literally in the Greek. He's, he's literally crying out for help. Oh, I want to do good. I've been doing bad. The people that love me, I've been doing bad, you know. He realized that the good that was in him was covered up by the flesh. He realized he needed Jesus, not religion. A lot, of, a lot of Christians today, they're living in their churches off of people's fellowship. But they don't sit under the word. They don't worship. They don't do any of those things. But they love church because of all the good people that are there. Nothing wrong with that either, except that they won't grow. All right, let's go on and finishing. Proverbs, I like what six says, 16 through 19 says this. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, let's, let's look at these things. Okay, Proverbs 6 is really good because it talks about the lazy man too. This is a proud look. Does God like a proud look? No, that's not staring at somebody in pride. That's somebody strutting around like they know it all. Have you ever had your child say to you, I know that. And yet they just got through blowing it. I knew that. Think about how silly that is. This is what he hates. A proud look, a lying tongue. One of the things I loved to do when I was a young man is stretch the truth. When I became saved, I found that that little stretching of the truth tried to follow me into my Christianity. And so God says, look, you're not speaking evangelistically. (laughs) Speak the truth. Okay? Say amen. All right, good. Then it says, proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Folks, we can go this far and say somebody that does something out of spite. I've had people do things. I've asked them to do specific things and they out of spite purposely didn't do it. Just to see how I was going to react. This is what God's talking about. Don't do that. That's silly. Hello? So hands that are innocent, shed innocent blood means to murder and as well as to plot against somebody else. And then a heart that devises wicked plans. Take a look at what's going on in the world. I'd say China had a wicked, the Communist China Party had a wicked plan when they released that China virus on everybody. They released it on the world and they wouldn't let the people travel into their own land. So they released it to everybody so they could step up while everybody's suffering and sell us and take control. That's what the devil's trying to do, take control of this planet, no matter who's volunteering for him. So we need to be fruitful Christians, very wise. Wise as serpents, gentle as what? Dubs, amen. And then he says, wicked plants, feet that are swift to run to evil. Then it says, a false witness, one who speaks lies, and one who sows This is the one that's really tough. Discord. Folks, what's going on between the politics today? The country is divided, right? It's discorded. You get a lovely guitar or or a lovely flute or a, a violin, and when it's not in tune, it's discorded. So what does Satan love to do? He comes in between a husband and wife and tries to get discord going over silly things. Did you put out the garbage? No, I thought you did. You know, hello. That little division there feeds them. If you found out you've got a rash on your arm, and if you ate something, that rash would grow, what would you do? Stop eating it! If you found out that you're fighting amongst each other, and your opinions and your resentments, is feeding the devil, and you're getting a worse rash... Stop feeding it, right? Why do we treat spiritual things as something different than our physical things? Hello, if you're eating too much and it's making you sick, stop eating so much. 
Hello. And if you, if you, and now this is the key. If for some reason you can't, there's a demon involved. If you can't stop doing some things, there's another spirit involved in that. It's not necessarily your flesh. So if that's the case, be wise and simply say, Lord, if there's a spirit involved in this pattern in my life, then I'm asking you to deal with it. And Lord, I'm taking authority over it right now. Do you see what I just said? Did you hear me clearly? Because certain patterns in life, I had an anger problem. When I was younger, um, certain things would set me off. And I wanted to throttle. And my cousin used to irritate me so bad. We'd almost come to blows. He knew how to push little buttons, you know. And I went to God. I said, God, I'm not just supposed to be this way. He should be able to hit every button that there is. And it shouldn't be able to affect me. What is it? And I didn't hear anything. So I just really prayed and asked God, really deliver me, Lord. Whatever it was. And so I just sat down in the chair and fell asleep. When I woke up, God had delivered me. It was like he split open my ribs and pulled a spirit out of me. When I woke up, my whole uh, attitude and atmosphere had changed. And the things that used to irritate me don't irritate me like that anymore. So sometimes there could be a spirit involved. Instead of saying, wonder, I wonder, just deal with it. Take authority over it, rebuke it. If there's not a spirit there, then you don't have to worry about it. But if there is, you might. So don't let it go. Say, I got everything. We can pick our friends, okay? But we can't pick on their faults. Hello. God knows I have plenty of them. But I married a woman that wouldn't be a nag. And that she would help me. And she's a help me. And vice versa. I will help her. But together we make a beautiful team. Hello. And we compliment each other. But God has to do that part. We can't just do that on our own. As, as charming as you are. You can't do that on your own. You need God's help. So guess what? Are you still rough around the edges? And you've been saved over 40 years? Guess what you haven't been doing? Seeking God as seriously as you should. Well, if you got something out of that tonight, would you give the Lord a praise? Amen.